Author and journal journalist Sasha Eisenberg explores all of this in his new book, The Lie Detectives, In Search of a Playbook for Winning Elections in the Disinformation Age. And Sasha joins me now. Uh, Sasha, this book could not be more uh, timely. Um, yesterday's cover of the USA Today had this, uh, you know, as, as the lead. So this is something that's really, uh, you know, broken through uh, with uh, the general um, populace. How should we be thinking about these challenges? I mean, if you're the average voter, um, what do you need to be looking for? And how are campaigns uh, trying to talk to people who are getting going to end up honestly being flooded with this stuff, probably quickly, probably on their phones, probably with not a lot of tools to figure out what's true and what's not? Yeah. Well, what generally um, was fascinating to me about this topic is the asymmetry that it creates. So if if those things had been you know, 20 years ago on a TV ad or on the front page of the newspaper, political professionals have a way of assessing who saw this. What do we think the impact is? Um, the stuff that's moving around digitally is, is often di very difficult to measure and very difficult to anticipate its impact. And so it has forced political professionals, the people running campaigns, the party committees, to uh, totally revisit a lot of their assumptions about when and how you respond to, to, uh, to attacks. So is there a difference between Republicans and Democrats in how they view this kind of material? Yeah, I mean, I think re Republicans these days often dispute the whole idea that disinformation is a meaningful category. I think if you talk to many Republicans, um, and we see this in, in the, the weaponization of government hearings that, that Jim Jordan is running, the state attorneys general who are suing tech companies over this, that, that what you hear a lot from Republicans is, you know, disinformation is something that a concept that Democrats created so that they could partner with government and academia to uh, pressure tech companies to um, silence conservative voices. And so you have a lot of Republican political operatives who are very interested in tracking what people are saying online, but they, they don't really buy the idea that this is a meaningful category. How do, but how, how do they square that when, I mean, if somebody were to m make fa uh, fake a, a robocall of Donald Trump, I mean, they, they just don't see that as a problem? Like they think that the term disinformation is is a sort of tool that Democrats use, you know, silence conservatives and also sort of as an excuse post-2016 to to um, evade sort of blame for, for running bad elections. I think it's what Democrats, I mean, it's sort of what Democrats probably say in inverse about Republicans claiming election fraud, right? This is a, a thing that you use as a, as a, as a crutch to, to, to claim that you, you were sort of uh, unfairly attacked. I think we're, what we are seeing now is that Republicans are very interested in uh, investigating the way that tech companies have enforced their content moderation policies. And it, it has right. made the tech companies far more reticent to be enforcing even rules that they themselves have, have adopted. To moderate anything at all. Fair. Um, for Democrats, if you're President Biden's campaign, what are you doing, like, right now to combat? What, what misinformation are you paying attention to? What are you ignoring? You obviously can't deal with all of it. I mean, it's like we're inundated. What is their sort of strategy? Yeah, their theory is to focus on what they call market-moving disinformation. So lots of people are lying on the Internet all the time. Lots of people are lying about Joe Biden all the time. Much of it is happening in corners of the Internet with people who support Donald Trump, are not persuadable voters. Um, they, in 2020, I go into a lot of detail about this research project that they did to identify not just which disinformation narratives had the biggest reach, but which were most likely to affect the opinions of the small share of voters who are actually persuadable. One thing that they found, yeah. you know, was that the stuff related to his age was a real electoral problem because, not because voters were worried about Biden's uh, physical fitness, but because they saw him as like a fundamentally weak political figure and that this mm -hmm. was a way of getting into that. Um, at the same time, they didn't see the Hunter Biden uh, stuff as a problem, even though a lot of people knew about it. Voters did not see uh, uh, Biden as being sort of driven by personal financial interest. And so they, what they are looking at is to identify the underlying anxieties and not end up in a position where they are chasing a piece of content every day when a new deep fake pops up or a new conspiracy theory, but understand what the underlying anxiety of voters is that, the, that those disinformation narratives are playing to and address the anxiety without, without um, sort of playing whack-a-mole with the content. Yeah, really interesting.